I got it. <laughs> <laughs> She's got done, right, okay. Well, uh, the next part of our program, uh, we have a, a great panel to begin a discussion of those topics that we've heard about this morning. Uh, and the intent here is that they are to begin the discussion. And that means that we want to draw all of you into that discussion as well. So uh, as we progress, please uh, feel, feel free to, to take part and interject and ask questions and so on and so forth. Our panel, uh, to my immediate right here is uh, Keith Hinkabine. Keith is with HNTB. He is the manager of the Great Lakes area, uh, which includes, I think, all the states that are represented here. Uh, so uh, if you do business with HNTB, chances are you'll run into Keith uh, once in a while. Uh, if you don't, I'm sure he'll be happy to give you his card and uh, you know, do a little salesmanship here as well. Uh, next to him is Leon Hank. Uh, Leon is the Chief Administrative Officer for uh, the Michigan DOT. Uh, if you look at their org chart, just about everything that isn't engineering in front of it reports to Leon. Uh, so he's got the planning functions, the finance, the, you know, the, the range of, of non-engineering activities, although when I made a comment similar to that last night, he said some engineers also work for me. So, uh, <laughs> And he also has a, a very uh, good background in public finance, uh, serving in many roles uh, in Michigan government before he came to the DOT uh, in the financial world. Uh, next to him is Van Walling. Uh, Van is the executive director of the Milwaukee area, I'm sorry, the Scientists and Engineers of Milwaukee, uh, which is an organization that has dedicated itself to trying to get more young people uh, interested in the uh, science, math, and engineering uh, kinds of, of fields. And uh, I know Van, uh, who's relatively new to that uh, spot, but I know him from his years at CH2M Hill uh, when he uh, left uh, that role, he was uh, at a vice president level. So he also worked uh, in his consulting uh, life with many of the states in this region. And he's, he's lucky uh, because the role working with young people and trying to get them interested in this profession is something that he was dedicating a lot of his time to when he was in the consulting industry and had the opportunity to make that avocation his vocation. So. Um, I, I hope that you were able to pay your bills before you got to this, <laughs> <laughs> this uh, side. So far, so good. Okay. Uh, at the um, end of the, the panel uh, is uh, Roberta Breaker. Roberta is with the Missouri Transportation uh, Department, and she is the Chief Financial, Financial Officer. So I think uh, from our panel, um, we'll hear a good deal about the engineering side and probably the finance side, uh, but probably a, a few other uh, areas as well. So let me start out by asking uh, each of the panelists, what you, you've heard uh, a bunch of things from uh, uh, our three speakers this morning about the future. What do you see as the, the major changes and challenges that will be affecting uh, the industry in the next uh, five to 10 years? I'll start with you, Keith. He, he said he was going to start, he was going to sit wherever I wasn't going to start, so. <laughs> that didn't work, did it? <laughs> now, we don't have mics up here. If anybody has trouble hearing, give a yell and then we'll, we'll try to fix that. But if, if we, we use the mic to get the video though, so I think I gave it to Leon that portable one. So. Okay, Leon, do you want us to switch this one around? Yeah, okay. Mine just passed out. Let me unplug. Just Is that on? Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Uh, major changes. You know, I'm not sure I have a ton to add than from Julius's. I mean, that's a hard act to follow, to be quite honest with you. And uh, so, but you know, as Julius was talking, I was making a lot of similar type notes on my notepad on just the similarities between what he was saying and what's going on in my organization. Um, and just to solidify what he was saying, we talked to, he, Julius talked a lot about the workforce and how it was uh, getting older. And looking at some of the statistics that, that I gathered from our industry, at h and which is roughly 3,500 folks, 3,500 to 4,000 folks, we have 47% of our people over the age of 40, and 8% within retirement in the next couple years. And if you think about that, not only are you going to lose 8% of your workforce in the next couple years, but with turnover, 
and growth goals, we're going to need to hire on the order of magnitude of about 700 people every single year if we're going to do it organically. And that's pretty mind-boggling. So this is particularly interesting in not only the development of our workforce, but attracting our workforce um, and different strategies depending on where they are in their particular stage of their career. Another thing that surprised me a lot is we have a lot of part-time employees at our company that are over the age of 60. Forty percent of the part-timers in our company are over 60 years old. So going back to what Julius was saying, that we have a lot of baby boomers that are going to continue to work, yet not nine to five every single day. And that's, we're already living that now and seeing that, and that's only going to get to be more and more of a factor in how we um, staff ourselves. So I think for the large part is um, similar to the way the statistics that Julia, Julius uh, discussed, we're, we're seeing that, we're living that, as most of you all are as well, in the public agencies and the private agencies, but we, I mean, the statistics back up what he said. We're getting older and we need to figure out a strategy as those individuals are exiting or becoming part-time, how do we retain them and how do we backfill them with the, the people that are coming out of the colleges right now. So I'm going to be quiet and pass the mic down. Well, Keith uh, leaned on Julius for his presentation, uh, his remarks. I may uh, lean on uh, Teresa. I, I thought she really hit the, hit the mark earlier this morning uh, also in talking about what kind of changes I, I think we will see. And in our organization, we have about 3,000 uh, employees, so normal turnover is we hire 150 people a year uh, at, our, at our turnover rate. And I see that accelerating dramatically then over the next few years as this uh, baby boomer um, um, bubble moves through. And I, I thought Teresa hit the mark on the extraordinary amount of, uh, of talent we're going to ask and, and diversity we're going to ask out of those new employees that we're going to hire. She mentioned things about all the new um, construction materials that we've got, new methods that we use for, for construction and rapid construction techniques. And, and so much of our business today now is traffic management. She talked about that. And, and uh, the whole move from being a construction organization to becoming uh, more of a maintenance and an operations organization, I think all dots are moving quickly in that direction. And we're certainly moving aggressively that way. And uh, she talked about the, the huge changes in, in planning and design, uh, context-sensitive design types of issues today, so much more involvement um, with the community. Uh, you just can't be an engineer in the back room anymore uh, cranking out plans. Uh, you've got to be in the community uh, all the time. You're, you're meeting with community members. We're doing public hearings almost every day at MDOT. We've got something like that going on. And so we're asking for our people to be excellent presenters and public speakers and to be fast on their feet in front of the community uh, and to work with community members on the side. And so just great soft skills that we're asking uh, engineers and, and, and other professionals uh, to have as well. She touched on uh, the complicated finance world we're in today with, with public-private partnerships and, and tolling. And if you look at the national data, it's very compelling on major projects today are being built mostly with uh, toll structures and with, uh, with, with tolls as a, as a financing mechanism. And about half of those projects are public-private partnerships. And still half the states in the country have not moved to those models yet. And we're one of those, and we're trying to catch up real quickly and doing everything we can. In fact, we have bills pending in the legislature right now on that. Um, so this very complicated world of finance that I think now we're requiring all our engineers and and planners and, and finance professionals to know a lot more about that. We've doubled our debt loads in the last couple of years. Uh, we're working with Wall Street much more closer than what we used to. Uh, so a very complicated finance environment today that we expect people to know about. And then technology-wise, she touched on that uh, as well. Everything from that, uh, that, that, that plow and a grader and everything else now has got GIS and GPS and all kinds of technologies built into it, uh, much more sophisticated than, than what we used to have. Um, and I think she wrapped up with, uh, with the accountability uh, issues that I think we'll see in the next round of, of reauthorization. Um, we expect that those will be big changes that the public 
and Congress will demand higher levels of accountability out of us for the money we spend in transportation. And then she talked about the ethanol issues and the cap and trade program, which I think will explode in the future and will address uh, climate change kinds of things through those types of, uh, types of programs. Um, so, Teresa, thank you for an excellent presentation. I thought you hit the mark real well. I think a lot of what we're talking about today are legacy issues. None of this should have surprised us because as we are all in our different uh, modes of connectivity to the transportation industry, whether we come from academia, uh, whether we come from uh, state or federal agencies or come from the, uh, the consulting community in support of the transportation industry, we're all facing the same dilemma much the same way as it's simply the staffing situation reflects the disinvestment over a period of years in transportation infrastructure. So we come together surprised, though we shouldn't be, uh, a year and a half ago, whenever, uh, about 15 months ago, with the collapse of the bridge in Minneapolis, and that became the focus. Infrastructure came back on the front page and then quickly disappeared from the front page. Much the same way the staffing has supported that lack of uh, the inability that we have to keep infrastructure and therefore the transportation industry and therefore transportation staffing uh, and to the point now where we are facing a crisis, not as dramatic as a bridge collapse, but a crisis nonetheless with respect to staffing simply because of the reactive nature that we've taken. And we're not going to turn the clock. We, we like to kid and say, well, the problem has been postponed a little bit because you're all concerned about baby boomers retiring, and since we don't have any 401ks or pensions anymore, we can't do that. <laughs> maybe so, but we are going to die. And, you know, <laughs> maybe now we're going to die at work instead of uh, die in retirement. So the, the issue doesn't go away, and it's, it's imperative that we do our best, even though it is tied to public works and public infrastructure and competing with all the other causes that are uh, requiring those public dollars, we need to do our best to bring a proactive approach to this staffing crisis, much the same way as we need to be, bring a proactive approach to the infrastructure crisis in general. So with, with that said, I think that it's going to require a multi-pronged uh, approach. I think it's going to have to have a, a short-term strategy to begin to fill some of these needs that are happening immediately, and in fact, the needs that we have, have had for the last few years, they will be made more, uh, will be intensified with the uh, stimulus package where we're going to need even more folks. We're going to have to have a medium uh, length, straight, a medium term strategy to a deal with that which is going to happen in five years or more. So that can maybe give us the benefit to go down and reach the kids in high school. Although, truth be told, that's very difficult to do. That's kind of late. And then the long term strategy, and Julius referred to it before, that it's hard to, to get excited about that, especially from the business perspective in terms of. You know, what's the return on investment when you're talking about dealing with uh, a fifth grade student who at best is plus seven, plus four, 11 years away from entering the workforce if in fact they enter our workforce. But we have to do that too. So we have to, in the face of the challenge, uh, uh, the staffing challenge that we're facing, I still think it behooves us not to overreact, not to become reactive, but to finally Finally, collectively, with the entities that are represented here today from academia, uh, the agency side, and the private side, take a overview perspective as to this staffing with both a short, medium, and long-term perspective. It's not an enviable position to be the last person to answer a question. <laughs> but I, th I think the key for me is to look at transportation and say that ultimately what we need is an ability to step back and create a compelling vision of what transportation can and should be in the United States. We are not the greatest generation. Um, and oftentimes when I say that, people look at me and go, well, thanks a lot. But 
when, when the Eisenhower administration decided they were going to create the interstate system, they had a compelling vision for transportation. And we have lost that over the years at the same time that we have lost a populace that will um, somewhat blindly support what government articulates as a vision. And so as transportation leaders now and in the future, we need people who can create that vision and sell it and gain support for it. And so I think those softer skills, I, at MoDOT, I often think it's not lack of talent that we ever suffer from. When we have a, a big new initiative, we have great technical talent that we can look out across our workforce and tap and say, I need you to do this. And whether that be planning or design or finance or construction, all of those technical skills, we find great individuals who are able to do that. But the ability to create and sell the vision and to communicate that to the taxpayers we need to support it so that we can indeed have a transportation infrastructure that is worthy of the United States and of whatever region we live in is, to me, a far greater challenge than um, than continuing to build the technical skills, which are crucial, but that, that I have found routinely we are able to find. Let me start with Roberta this time, so she doesn't have to be the, the last person to answer the question. And I'm going to, like, just toss it randomly. <laughs> I, I'd like you to build a little bit on that. Um, if if uh, transportation organizations are going to create that vision and communicate that vision, what does that mean for how they have to operate? Uh, whether they're public agencies or consulting uh, firms or academic institutions that are involved in transportation, what, what does it mean uh, for, for how they do their business? It means being, um, and it's become the phrase that everybody used, but it, it means being open and transparent. It's no longer having predetermined what the solution is. It is working with your stakeholders, whether they be um, planning organizations or transportation management agencies or city councilmen or legislators or property owners or whoever those people are and, and, and convincing them of the rightness of a solution and the need for a solution that goes beyond um, their own personal interest. Okay. Does that answer the question? I don't know. We'll find out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Are we building upon that same question? Yes, please. Okay. It's sooner or later I'm going to get back to K-12, so I might as well just jump on it now. <laughs> I think it's incumbent upon all of us here today and the organizations that we represent that we have to look at the, uh, the workforce continuum that was on the slide before. And beyond just looking at that workforce or that talent development um, continuum, we need to say, as I, in, when I'm going out and making my pitch to different businesses and industries and agencies and so forth, in terms of uh, uh, contributing in whatever fashion is appropriate, to our, what we call a, a strategic collaborative for the development of STEM talent in southeastern Wisconsin. Quite simply, it's this. You can't complain. I don't usually use complain, but I'll use complain here today. You can't complain about what is or isn't coming out of the talent pipeline unless you are willing to roll up your sleeves and do something about what's going into that pipeline. So the biggest single change that I would see, the biggest single way that I would see that vision change manifested in the day-to-day -day operations of these different entities, these different employer organizations and academia, is that we are going to have to realize that we are all codependent upon each other. And in fact, the only issue I would take with the continuum as it was depicted, it was depicted as a straight line. And in fact, it should be depicted as a circle. And it's one in which we have a vested interest. And we have to determine how best we can do that from the standpoint and the vantage point of our respective organizations, whether we're providing <coughs> advocacy, uh, which can be something as simple as why this talent development is, uh, is important to my organization. It's an economic development issue. It's not, as I've had to tell people, it's not just geek self-preservation. It's not a bunch of engineers worried about where their replacements are coming from, but has true economic development ramifications. And we have not only a business imperative 
uh, to work together to make that system better from uh, not just K-12, or now I you know, hear K-12, K-16, K-20, uh, K to gray, uh, however you want to characterize it. We need to realize that we all have a role to play there to make things better. We can't just complain about the numbers that aren't coming out of the system, the competencies that aren't coming out of the system, or the diversity that isn't coming out of the system. We all have to step up to the plate and do something about it. Skipping? You're skipping, okay. Well, I, I, I just have a couple questions actually to ask the audience rather than me telling them what's going on. I'd like for them to tell me what's going on. Um, you talk about the day-to-day -day operations. And my question to everyone out there is who in the last year, two years, either <coughs> believes, feels, or thinks that you're being asked to do more with less? Has anyone heard that yet? <laughs> there can't be an individual out there that has not heard that yet. Now my next question is, do you think it's due to the idea that we don't have enough trained staff to do the work, or is it a matter of economics? I think it's clearly a matter of economics. The only way the society expands its standard of living is to produce more with the same amount of effort. And so, so by definition, you find ways of working smarter, not harder, to use a well-worn phrase. That's the whole basis of improving our standard of living. So it, it has to be economic in nature. Yeah, I, be, I be, you know, the, the individuals that are coming out of the universities today are the smartest individuals that we've seen. I mean, they're a lot smarter than I was when I came out of the university system. They are really up to date on technology. They're very prone to absorbing ideas, and they like taking ownership of things as well. The thing that I that, that we need to do is how do you tap that, and how do you further blossom that into, as Julius was talking about, uh, that work-life balance and all the things that we're, we were used to when we came out of school of thinking was the norm. And I think that's the real challenge in the day-to-day -day operations is how do the people that are managing those individuals, how do they relate to them when you have baby boomers, Ys, and Xs all reporting to you? How do you do that? And that's very difficult to do. So, yes? Yes, I'd like to piggyback on your question. Okay. Uh, and, and if so, how would you define that smartness? And what more would you like to see in the students coming out? I, I don't know if they have to be smarter, but I think they have to know uh, and have a greater grasp of uh, much broader topics than what maybe they did 10 or 20 years ago. And, and uh, Ernie shared that I'm not an engineer by background, but I do work with a lot of them. Uh, but I'm an accountant by background, so we're from the same kinds of discipline. I might probably offend some of the engineers in the room, but uh, <laughs> but you know we're we're from that background where we probably do work in the corner, and that's you know traditionally been how we work. And, and uh, as I tried to talk to uh, earlier, you know I think today we want so much out of uh, engineers, so many more soft skills today than maybe what they had to have five or ten years ago. And so I think that's probably the 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 best thing that our staff talks to me about in terms of what we want. It's just that our engineers are out in the, in the public so much more today. They're doing presentations all the time, um, public speaking opportunities. They're working with city councils and local governments and, and, our, and MPOs and just so many partnerships. Our, our director likes to say that we don't do anything alone at the department anymore in transportation. Everything we do is a partnership with somebody, whether it's with counties, whether it's with cities, whether it's with MPOs, uh, construction industry, uh, transit providers, um, so many partnerships today. And, and so you need people who are very people-oriented, uh, who are very outgoing individuals, and who have this um, broad range of, uh, of skills. Uh, and on top of that, they've, they've got to be a good engineer um, as well. Well, that's a lot to ask, I think, of, of people. but. Um, on what Kevin said, I think we are seeing that come out of the university. So 
Um, when I asked our engineers, I said, what's the number one thing I could tell the people from the university community? And that was his message. He said, you know, um, communicate that that's what we need. We really need people. Um, and he really stressed the presentation skills. That if we can get our engineers to be um, much more in tune with that and much more comfortable with that, um, that that's become such a, a big part of our job anymore. Now that drives questions for me on um, do we have to have engineers in some of these jobs? I think the jobs are changing now. When I think of, uh, and again, I gotta be careful here because some of my engineer buddies won't like this comment, but our seven regions are all run by an engineer and our 26 transportation service centers underneath those regions are all run by engineers. And I think we're challenging ourselves as an organization and saying, in light of what I just said and all the vast skills that we want out of people who run these, these areas, do they have to be an engineer to even do that work? Certainly we need engineering expertise, but does the person at the top who runs this region or who runs this, this uh, uh, transportation service center, which is our uh, district office to, to many of you, um, does that person have to be an engineer? Is that the best skill set even to have in, in light of what we've talked about here? And so. Um, I'm hopeful that uh, in my career at, uh, at the Michigan Department that maybe we'll see the day when a non-engineer will actually run one of our, one of our major business units, um, and, I, and I hope we're close to that um, because I, I think it, it doesn't have to be an engineer. It could be a planner. It could be a finance person. As long as that person can work with engineers, I think we could see those kinds of changes um, coming around. So those are my comments on, uh, on, on the work environment. I would mirror uh, my predecessor's comments here, both with respect to the, the technical competency of the uh, group that is coming out today. But it, what, what I think goes, it's left unsaid, and maybe I'll follow uh, Keith's lead here and uh, pose it as a question, or maybe just leave it hanging as a question for your consideration, is if in fact we could address the number issue, the number of bodies, the, the number of seats that need to be filled in our respective organizations. And if we could do so with the competencies that we've described and with all due respect that they are changing as we speak and be, we're expecting a lot more well-rounded, non-traditional uh, skill set coming from our engineers, is that enough in the face of the changing demographics that Julius talked about? Is it enough, for example, if all that can get done just to, just to make a very um, purposeful exaggeration of fact, if those can all be accomplished with white males, I would submit that that doesn't solve all of our problem. It doesn't solve the challenge that we face. And until we reach out to first generation college students and urban youth, then we've only solved part of the problem. I don't even know if this answers the question, but the thought that I had was um, when Julius was talking earlier, he talked about the, the Generation Y being much more cognizant of social responsibility and this desire to give back to the community. And I think historically we don't think of that when we think of engineers and accountants. You know, this is this very linear world where you just do a thing and it, and it doesn't touch people. But, but that's not the case with transportation. Um, transportation impacts everything that we do. It is the reason we have a good school system. It is the reason we have good health care. It is the reason we have economic development. Transportation truly makes all of those things happen. And so particularly, you know, we struggle, I think, sometimes in government when we talk about the salaries aren't competitive or the opportunities aren't there or, or whatever it is. But, but I, it's probably true that the salaries are not as competitive as they are in the public sector. But I don't think it is true that you don't have, even in the accounting or, or engineering world, abundant opportunities to give back to society. In fact, I think certainly that's why I work in government after you know 28 years still do this. It's because I perceive this as an area where I contribute and I give back. So for those people who at K through 12 maybe don't know what they want to do with their life, but they do have a sense of, I want to know that, is it, that it is important. There is, in my mind, few things that are as important 
as transportation and a good transportation system. We heard uh, uh, Teresa outline uh, a whole bunch of, of things that are happening in the transportation world. Uh, and it would point to a, a very exciting future if even a few of those things come to uh, fruition in a, a large way. And yet, uh, all of you have said in one way or another that, um, and Julia said it as well, and Clark said it, that transportation isn't all that sexy. How do we make it sexier for, for those young people who you know, might be more interested in computer engineering or mechanical engineering or chemical engineering, uh, or as I was when I was 20, history? Uh, <laughs> I think we can compete with that. I'll give it to you. You want to pass that down? Okay. Yes. Yes, okay. All right. I haven't even said the question. I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> Well, I'll play the devil's advocate, Ernie, and uh, I'll, I'll say, why aren't we a sexy business to be in? Why isn't this cool to do what we do? I think it is. And I, I think this is, uh, excuse me for maybe oversimplifying this, but I think there's a lack of marketing. Mm -hmm. When we take the opportunity to meet with those um, uh, middle schoolers, uh, uh, junior high kids, and when we can really explain to them what we do, and how cool it is to build a bridge, to, uh, to build a new road somewhere, and all the economic development that comes around with that, to improve a, a, a rapid transit system, or to put in a light rail system somewhere, to do something like what's going on in Europe. When we get a chance to actually talk to young kids about that and tell them what we do, I think they're very impressed. We bring kids into our place and we show them our aeronautics facilities, we show them the planes that we have. We even take them up for a ride in an airplane. We tell them what it's like. Our pilots talk to them and tell them what it's like to be a pilot and work for a transportation department. And, and we show them other aeronautics type of work that we do. And then we'll, we'll show them bridge design and show them how we design a bridge and how you, how you do all that. I think they are impressed with that. So I, I think we just have to be a lot uh, more aggressive and be better at marketing what we do do because I think it is cool and it is sexy what we do and, and I'm, I'm like Roberta I'm, I'm a 32 year employee and I could have moved on a long time ago and done something else but there is something about public service and by the way I'm married to a public school teacher and, and who now teaches in a college and same thing for her and I know that's for many of you who are in the university environment um, I mean you're not there because you want to be a millionaire you're there because you have a chance to influence uh, the public and, and maybe individuals and and uh, you believe in public service, and you get a big kick out of that. And I think, uh, Roberta, that's why we're at this and why we, why we do it. And uh, there's great satisfaction in that. And so I think uh, we, we don't market or sell that very well either on how satisfying it is to be in public service and the kinds of things uh, you can do. Um, so I, I think we need to do a, a far better job at that. And I don't know how we do that, but I know we have to, we have to start and we have to be more aggressive. As, uh, as uh, Julius and Clark uh, uh, pointed out, um, we are going to be in fierce competition with, uh, with our private sector friends uh, here as well for those, those uh, limited people that are going to be available for the workforce uh, in the future. And we're going to have to get and, and be much better at, at our marketing and, and uh, what we have to offer because I think we have great, great opportunities. Anyone else? Go ahead, Jones. It's going to be so important to that sales function I talked about earlier and branding. We talk about branding on, on, on a professional level. We've got to do it for our industry because, to Roberta's point, we touch everything. We make everything else possible. And to the extent that we let people know what it is we do, it gives us a chance to buy that leverage with that incoming group of folks or those people that we might not even see a return on for those you know, 10 years or so. But if we don't start it, we never change the perception. It was the same thing that Genevieve said. We've got to make sure that people understand who we are and that we're, you know, that uphill battle becomes easier if we all buy in and start to sell the business and promote the brand of transportation. And that to me is just, you're, you're absolutely right. It's huge, absolutely huge. John, did you want to make a comment too? Well, yeah, one of the things that really bugs me about this whole discussion, I doesn't surprise you or anything, <laughs> is that if I'm a, a young person and I'm thinking about going into engineering and I'm looking at the different fields of engineering 
And I may think transportation is really cool, but I'm not willing to forfeit $20,000 a year in starting salary to go to work for a transportation agency. If I go to work for a consulting firm, I'm going to spend the first, first four years of my life going through some kind of EIT program with a high availability rate, and I'm never going to meet the client. Um, you know, and that, those activities are reserved for senior uh, engineers, team leaders, things of that nature. Um, the same thing's true with DOTs. You know, they, it depends upon every one of them is different, but they always have some type of VIT training program where you spend the first four years of your life basically in a corner, you know, cranking out something. Uh, or, you know, managing traffic or counting, you know, it's just, uh, if, if the market forces have something to do with this, that I couldn't, if I had a, a, a daughter or a son that wanted to be an engineer, I'm not sure I could advise them to go into civil engineering, simply because I don't think that they, you know, it's not, one time that they're going to lose, they're going to lose every year. Keith, are you a loser? I, <laughs> <laughs> Depends on who you ask, I guess. <laughs> I, I'm not quite sure how to respond to that, um, if you're asking me to. But, <laughs> but I mean, I, there's a certain amount of... of I, I agree with you, to be quite honest with you. And, you know, I'm going to go back to, to something that, you know, I have high school kids and middle school kids, and, and, and they talk about, you know, what do you do? Um, and I try my best to try to explain it. Um, but they really look at engineering as very process-driven and not very creative. That's the way they look at it. They, you know, in today's world where we talked about instant messaging, and we talked about technology, and we talk about computers and video games and all this stuff that's wrapped around them now. I mean, you can see movies now with not even real people in it. That's what excites them. So somehow, in my opinion, we need to put the creativity back into engineering and let them know that there's some creative forces behind this rather than, what did you do? I don't want to go to work today and draw a bridge on a piece of paper. You know, that's just what the perception is right now. We need to change that. And it, is it exposure? Um, is it better marketing, better selling? Uh, anytime I go talk to a high school student and I talk to them and show them something rather than just stand up and lecture, but if I show them something, their eyes start opening up a little bit more. Um, but then they go home and play a video game and they forget all about what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> so. Um, I'm not sure. I think it's just a combination of about a half a dozen different things that we need to be doing to make our industry a little more um, sexy, as you said, and start retaining the brightest and the best. Um, and I, I and I'll maybe get to it later. But we talked about all the soft skills too. You know, I think that's slowly changing, but um, I think we have a ways to go. To be quite honest with you. So, you know, just as far as, it just needs to be in a better package, I think, and let them know that there's, is, there's some creativity and there are opportunities for them to allow them to get a little bigger than sitting at a desk drawing a bridge, which is really kind of what they think it is, quite honest with you. Okay, uh, go ahead, Leanne. I can't resist the opportunity to respond to that one. We're out of order here, so my apologies to my two colleagues. I'll let them go to, go next year. But I, I would challenge the, the premise that uh, the, the $20,000 issue and that that's, uh, that's, that's critical. You want me to send you the, the average starting salary? No, for uh, let me get to, to uh, let me take a different approach to that. Um, I'll, I'll accept that, that uh, we probably can't pay as much as, uh, as the private sector. No, I know it's a private sector, but as, you know, a chemical engineering student that starts or a, a computer science engineer, um, it's going to make a big enough, you know, salary increase at the, at the start that you're never going to catch up. And that's your basis for not advising your own children to, to go into civil engineering? I think there are other things. There are things like opportunity for foreign travel for 
you know, getting involved in a large industry. I, I you know, it, but yes, yeah, salary has a lot to do with it. You know, I always hear people, um, I do a lot of work uh, with the trucking industry, and I hear about the trucking industry shortage, and I think, well, geez, you know, if you could just give them a decent life, if you could pay them a decent salary, they come. Um, but, and, and that's where I was going to go with this. I think at the, in, a, in a DOT environment, I think that's what we offer. I think we offer a, a very decent lifestyle, uh, opportunities for a for good family life, to raise your, your, your children and your family in a, in a, you won't get rich, but you will make a decent uh, salary. Um, on the other hand, we see a lot of mobility between the consul uh, consulting sector and, and, uh, and the DOTs. We have people who leave, we start with us, they work for a few years, they become very valuable. They can make a lot more money in the consulting uh, industry, and they'll leave, and some of them enjoy doing that. And we have the reverse that happens quite a bit. We have engineers who uh, started out in consulting. Uh, they did the 80-hour weeks and, and lots of billing pressure that they had for a number of years. They maybe made uh, more money, um, but they looked at our lifestyle and said, uh, I'd rather work for the, for the department and maybe make less money, a little bit less money. Um, but it's a better lifestyle, and, and so we have people who flip back and forth between that all the time. I think that's healthy, and I think that's good, and I would encourage people to go into either one of those professions. Um, but, I, but I think we do have good things to offer uh, at a DOT, and I, and I think we can market and, and sell ourselves as, a, as something that's a very satisfying career uh, as well.